Right, well here we are at the London Book Fair 2012. Uh, I bumped into John Farron who wrote the book for Brett Wilder Books uh, about Guy Gibson. I thought this was a good opportunity to ask him some questions. Uh, so John, tell me, uh, why did you write this book about Guy Gibson? Well, when I was a small boy, I actually came across a copy of um, his book, Enemy Coast to Head, in my father's uh, bookcase. And I read it, and I was enthralled, absolutely enthralled. I mean, I was a small boy, and it was a ripping tale of adventure, and very well written. Um, and I did a school project on him, um, because we had to do something. I, I just read that book, so we did it, and I wrote to the London Times, and they sent me a obituary and some stories about the Dam Busters. And I just got completely enthralled by him, as he became a boyhood hero. And then when you were inviting suggestions for the Heroes of the RAF series, I, I like writing about people rather than necessarily bases and stuff like that. So he became the obvious one to write about a boyhood hero. And you know, the thing that's really nice, Rupert, is the fact he's still a hero of mine. Having now researched him and, and really looked into him, I actually still find that I like the chap and I like what he did. And he's still, you know, done something I haven't, thankfully, never had to do. Yeah. I, I, I see. Well, um, so what was Guy Gibson's background? Was he a full-time RAF officer? Did he just join up for the duration? Um, what was his background? Originally, originally he wanted to be a test pilot. Um, that was his original interest. And to, if you want to be a test pilot, the easy way was to just join the RAF and learn how to fly, and then he would go and do that. So I suppose you could argue maybe he was a bit of a thrill seeker, um, wanted to be a test pilot, because no normal pilot wants to be a test pilot, in my opinion, in the period of my father, who was also a pilot. And he got called up when the war started, and he... And he, ser and he served there. And, and basically, I think he got selected for the Dambusters raid because A, he'd survived so long, which was quite some achievement. He'd done two full tours. Uh, and he was an outstanding commander. He was a very inspirational man. He wasn't necessarily everybody's cup of tea, but it, people who loved him would fly with him. And he had a reputation. He brought his crews back. You know, and that's something. And quite frankly, he knew the right people, I think, in the right place. He'd got the, he'd got the eye and, and the ear of um, Bomber Harris by that stage anyway, because he was a go-getter. Um, you know, Gibson's, Gibson's view, was he a cerebral commander? No, I don't think Guy Gibson was ever, could ever be called cerebral. That was probably more Leonard Cheshire. But Guy Gibson just had this view that by hard work and by dint of professionalism, you could do anything. And anybody who said otherwise was wrong. And that was certainly Cochrane's view of him, that he was just one of those men that would actually have a go weigh up the odds, work out how best to do the job and do it. He did invent the master bomber concept, although he, not being intellectual, he didn't call it that. But de facto, what he did over the dams was invent a whole new way of bombing. He was calling people up and going, your turn. He was flying over there and monitoring it. He invented it without necessarily realising what he was doing. It was what was needed at the time, so he did it. And I think, to me, that's what made Guy Gibson um, such an outstanding leader of men. So this concept of the master bomber that uh, Guy Gibson developed, is that something the RAF took up or, or was it just particular to him? Yes, it did, very much so. And of course, I'd, I'd argue actually that the, um, the best example of it later on was in fact Leonard Cheshire, particularly when he was later on commanding 617 Squadron. They polished it and they perfected it and they improved on what Gibson had created. But the point is, anybody, and I should know, it's what I do for a living, anybody can, can improve and adapt and create, but it's a creation, it's the actual original idea, that's the hard part. So yes, they did. And to some extent, the RAF are still doing it now, although of course bombing techniques have very much changed in the modern era. Force and we haven't got that many aeroplanes left anyway and bombers are a completely different kettle of fish to what they were then but the technique is still broadly the same there is still somebody with the overview keeping an eye on it watching the skies behind sending people in in the right order so yes i think the raf did is have stuck with it okay well uh, after the dam busters raid um you write in your book that gibson was taken off operational duties uh, what, what was he doing when he wasn't flying well, quite, quite rightly, we had that unusual position that Guy Gibson, who'd become very famous, unusually they promoted that he'd led the Dambusters raid, and quite clearly, Goebbels, who was no fool, if they, if they got Guy Gibson, this would have been an absolute PR disaster for the RAF. So they had to take the guy off, probably the leading bomber of, of pilot of, of, of the generation by then. They had to take him away from doing what he did best, because it would have been too much of a publicity coup for the Germans. So they sent him into, that's where he started writing Enemy Coast Ahead, they sent to me to write textbooks and manuals and after a while you know it, it just wasn't Guy Gibson's scene so they then sent him out to the bases he managed to wangle his way to go out and to they were starting to put bases together in groups so he started becoming a group admin officer in th the centre to the staff college um, and it really he was clearly being groomed to go up and uh, eventually be a scrambled egg but it wasn't 
who wasn't for Gibson, he wanted to fly. And in the end, he managed to wangle his way out into missions. He did a few. He did a few bombing missions. He was still had the knack because he was still dropping on targets. And then in the end, they sent him out to be uh, to, to play with mosquitoes. And of course, in the end, his luck ran out. Uh, so, so he was killed in Operation Flying. He was killed in Operation Flying. Um, there were many who think that he shouldn't have been allowed to go back in Operation Flying. Uh, there are many that think it was one of the worst deeds that Cochrane ever did by uh, Cochrane and Harris ever did by allowing him to do it. But quite frankly, how do you stop Guy Gibson? You know, this this was what the man wanted to do. He was there at the beginning of the war. He was on a holiday in Wales at the time when um, the the invasion was announced of D Day. He wanted to be there at the end of it. Is my opinion. You know, you've been at the beginning. You've been in. The the tough times of course you want to see it through he hated the Nazis with a very simple black and white view mm. you know, he had a simple view of the world and the English were right and the Germans particularly the Nazis were wrong um, and, and, and he wanted to see them defeated and he wanted to be part of the actual defeat not just actually defending England but actually bringing what he would have seen as truth and decency uh, to bear so yes he was killed operationally um, there's a suggestion that he liked the Mosquito because uh, Mick Martin, one of his Dambuster co colleagues, had actually taken it to an airbase and shown him the wonders of it. It was fast, it was move maneuverable, it was agile, it was everything that Gibson, who wanted to be a test pilot, would have loved. <laughs> Way better than flying a Lancaster, which at the end of the day, even Gibson used to describe it sometimes as being like a bus driver. You, know, you just fly at the route that you tilled. The Mosquito, you had freedom, maneuverability. So Gibson practiced on the Mosquito, he flew himself up to Scotland, he, he familiarised himself with it, he saw what the potential was particularly guided by Mick Martin, off he went and he became, and, and, and he started being a master bomber in the Mosquito. But the Mosquitoes, particularly the Canadian built ones, were not always the most reliable of um, aeroplanes and it's my opinion, and there were many conflicting views on this, but it's my opinion his luck ran out, the, en the engine malfunctioned, he was flying low, there's not much room for manoeuvre when, an when an engine goes at low, at low flight. So okay, um, one, one final short question, Sorry. Um, why should someone buy the book? Because it, I think it's a cracking good read about a very interesting man. It's a very well laid out book, some very interesting pictures. And I think that if you've, all you've ever seen of him is watching the Dan Busters film, this book is accessible, it's interesting, it shows you the pictures and it gives you the story you need in a manner that anybody would enjoy reading. OK, well, thanks very much, John. Very kind of you to take the time to talk to us. Uh, that was John Fairham, the author of the book about Guy Gibson, published by Brett Wilder Books. Uh, it's available uh, in all good bookshops, as they say, uh, and on Amazon and as an e-book. Thank you very much. <laughs>